Yeah, you're very welcome along this morning. If you've just joined us, it is 8 o'clock on Monday, the 27th of April. And uh, Jaron Owen here with you every morning from 7.30 all the way through until 10. We've extended the show for the duration of lock-in, which, you know, might be quite a while at this point, Owen. Uh, hopes are receding for us to see any live sport in the near future. So, you know, an extra half an hour of the morning. That's exactly what people want. Give the people what they want, Owen. What, what is receding your hopes this particular morning, Jer? I don't know, just the, the general mood music. Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm actually completely wrong. There's various stories in the back pages about how at least the planning stage has reached the point where consideration is being given to a certain amount of testing going on for inter-county players. I, I just, I can't, I can't work out how willing or otherwise people would be to submit to this level of testing for, you know, we keep being reminded, an amateur sport. Yeah, I guess that's that's probably a good point. That's if you want to look at the worldwide possibilities of uh, actually having live sport over the next couple of weeks, it, it all kind of seems like uh, some sort of futuristic movie where you've got a very big budget and uh, a, a very flashy cast. Uh, but can that be replicated in, in an amateur organisation that we have in Ireland is a question that I think we've all had. And uh, it's a question that's going to be very difficult to answer and one that actually seems that it's uh, quite far away in terms of the possibilities at the moment. That, uh, like you, you don't want to be a, a downer on everything that people say and I think hope is really important. Uh, but realistically, if you look at what the Bundesliga is going to do soon in, tr in trying to get back on the, the pitch, you can't just take that and transfer it to Irish sport. No, no, you can't. The fact that the um, that there's news coming from Italy, which I'll get to in a minute, which is positive about uh, at least a, a graded return to something, is interesting. Um, and the fact that the Germans are going back, that will at least, uh, you know, build some kind of a template for this is how we did it. Maybe that's not going to be applicable in this instance, but it might be applicable the next time that something like this happens, where everybody realizes, oh, okay, this is how the Germans did it the last time, and that worked for them. There was aspects of this plan that worked in this country, and there were aspects of this plan that worked in this country, and you bring all these things together so that we at least are learning that um, the next time there's a global pandemic, just let that linger there for a second, that uh, we'll at least have a, a template in place for getting through it quicker. What's, I haven't seen the Italy story, what's the... Top line there. Well, I'll, I'll read the sports bulletin for you here. Italian clubs will be allowed to return to individual training on the 4th of May and team training on the 18th of May. The Italian Prime Minister says the country is ready to enter the next phase of its response to the coronavirus by lifting the county, country's lockdown restrictions. Serie A has been suspended, obviously, since the 9th of March with 12 full round of games still to play. The Italian Football Federation said last week that it would push back the formal end of the season from the 30th of June to the 2nd of August to allow time for remaining games to be completed. So, um... Obviously, Italy, we've seen the scenes. That was a horrific experience for the country to still be going through. I don't want to minimise exactly what, what is happening, but the trend is slowly going in the right direction. Um, I know. With that happening and with there at least being a plan, maybe this plan is completely foolish. Maybe this plan makes no sense. Maybe this plan is far too early. But uh, certainly they're talking about it. And the 4th of May is like essentially next week. Um, and the 18th of May is only two weeks beyond that, so that would be collective team training, and there's no point in doing collective team training unless you think the, the sport is coming back. So in Spain, the Spanish season is unlikely to return until the summer, according to the country's health minister. La Liga president, Javier Tebas, has given three potential restart dates between the end of May and the end of June, but Spain's health minister added that the league's plans to provide daily COVID-19 tests for players requires government approval. When these stories emerge, you always kind of feel like the La Liga president and the Spanish health minister must have had a conversation. And uh, I guess that's always an assumption too far because they have different outcomes that they want. The Spanish health minister wants public health. The La Liga president needs to get football back. Otherwise, uh, some of those clubs are going to go bust. The Danish FA said they might not be able to host matches at next year's rescheduled Euro 2020 tournament. Um, obviously, this tournament has been pushed back a year. As a result, Copenhagen faces a clash with the start of the Tour de France. I didn't realise that the Tour de France was starting in Copenhagen next year. All host cities, including Dublin, until, have until Thursday to confirm to UEFA that they can host games. So there'll be news coming this week about how many games Dublin might be hosting in 2021, if at all. The GPA is remaining tight-lipped on a failed drugs test by an inter-county footballer. 
It was reported over the weekend that a player in his 30s allegedly failed the test after a National League game in February. The player in question has 14 days from receipt of notification to respond to the charge with a request to have the B sample um, tested and must be given within seven days. It's unclear if the player in question will contest the charge. And in rugby, the IRFU, according to reports this morning, will continue to back Bill Beaumont for a second term with voting already underway for the uh, president of World Rugby. The IRFU are set to keep faith with the man who's led World Rugby since 2016 rather than backing the former Argentine international Agustin Pichot. The results will be announced on the 12th of May. Here's what's coming up on the show this morning for you. Six minutes past eight. Got to get into the sports pages. Um, Alan Quinlan is going to join us at 8.40. We'll talk about the tectonic plates of World Rugby and uh, how much of an impact this is actually going to have on grassroots, etc. If you have any opinions on that, you can get us on uh, 0879 How's the head? Is coming your way at uh, 8.50. Mount Rushmore today is Galway. We have Mark Rossini Kelly, uh, Michael Lester picking the Mount Rushmore of Galway for us. And then Miguel Delaney is going to join us at 9.40 to talk to us about... Uh, the Newcastle takeover and the sports washing that the Saudi Arabian government are getting into. Um, on the Galway one, do you at least accept that this is a, a difficult one for people to pick? Yeah, it is. It's not. It's uh, like uh, a good collection of sports. Uh, like it's it's not something that you would find too easy to actually come up with your top five or six names or or even when it comes to the, the top one or two I think that there is going to be a bit of debate around that like who is the person that will represent hurling if you only had one person to represent the sport and same with football those are both extremely difficult questions and you suspect I'm just trying to think off the top of my head you suspect that those are going to be the leading sports when it comes to this uh, conversation later on so it's a difficult one for sure uh, one of the more difficult ones and we've got a, a proud sporting tradition I think it's fair to say uh, they do you would say that there are other counties who would have been more surprising in terms of their abilities on the world stage, or like, has Galway have Galway underachieved? Like, what what are you trying to get at? Is is there particular teams? Well, is there particular individuals? Well, when you, you're talking about football, right? So they had uh, that amazing team, um, the Sean Purcell team, and then they have the the other team, John O'Mahony's team, and that's. Essentially it, right? Well, they've won an All-Ireland and multiple All-Irelands in the other code as well, which definitely... In football, sorry, but in football, your... yeah, sorry. But in, in, in hurling, like, it definitely feels like they've underachieved. They, they left countless All-Irelands behind them. Um, that team of the 80s was one of the all-time great teams, but doesn't have the All-Irelands to show for it. And partly because they didn't have any games every year. But uh, I don't know, I feel like that perhaps... Look, we can put this county to this question to... Maura Trassa and Michael Lister a little bit later on, but have Galway as a sporting county underachieved? I don't... I think if you take everything in isolation and perhaps pre-2017, you could have definitely made that argument about the hurlers, definitely. Uh, I think... I'm not sure if that team around uh, the turn of the century necessarily underachieved with two All-Irelands. I think that's a pretty good uh, turnaround for, for any team, really, to produce two All-Irelands. Like... Uh, I, I wonder if sometimes we kind of hold up this Galway team as like one of the best teams of all time and that they deserve to win five All-Irelands. Maybe they did, and, but I would say that perhaps two All-Irelands is, like that's a decent return for that Galway team. Maybe they could have deserved three or if the, the age profile had been right for a full decade, they might have been able to squeeze out four, but I don't think it was a massive underachievement. I think when you are, are partaking and trying to win the All-Ireland in both codes every single year, there was going to be a, dilute, a diluting of what you're actually going to win. Cork are one of the rare counties you've been able to do it down through the years uh, and their output of both has been excellent. But then then again, their output this century really hasn't been amazing either. So like it's, I'm not sure if I'd go with, with underachievement. I think that but every sports fan, a, a, any fan in Ireland can describe themselves as long-suffering. And Galway are, are no different to that. They've had near misses and they've had close shaves. But whether or not they've, uh, they're a county of underachievers, I, I don't think I would go that far. All right. Uh, 0879 is the number. You can uh, get us on Twitter. Use the hashtag OTBAM. Or, of course, you can always just uh, tweet the show. Add off the ball AM is the show's Twitter account. Ten minutes past eight. Time for the papers. OTB AM. So we're going to start this morning with OffTheBall.com. The 32 Mount Rushmore is Galway's greatest sports people. Um, there aren't brilliant soccer players and there aren't uh, rugby players who have bestrode the game like a colossus. There are local cult heroes, I guess is the point I'm making. There are athletes, in fairness, um, male and female, but 
like where is their you know where is their Premier League player who had ten seasons in the Premier League? Where is their fifty, sixty, seventy Ireland caps in rugby and football? Um, right. Uh, the other stories that we have this morning: Lee Dixon explains what it was that made Ryan Giggs so deadly. Uh, an hour-long feature-length interview with Lee Dixon on yesterday's show. Um, likewise, a feature-length interview uh, with Shane Byrne. I threw my first line out for Ireland directly in front of my stag do. Uh, null and void. How can that work, Lee Dixon, on finishing the season? He feels like it has to be finished. And uh, Kieran Fitzgerald, the Curfin great, has retired from playing club football. An absolute honour to play for Curfin GA Club and for Galway as well. And uh, so that is um, the homepage of... Uh, Offtheball.com a couple of minutes ago, but we've also just published um, Walking on Water, the story of how the GPA won their war with the GAA. This is a, a great piece from Arthur James O'D. It is an, an oral history of the Club Energise ad, which was called Lake, where a bunch of hurlers and footballers literally walked on water in Lugala. And I say literally as in, in the ad, they literally walked on water, as opposed to metaphorically, they literally were walking on the lake on stilts. Uh, in the freezing cold. And this is the story of how the ad came to be and what it represented. Spoken with loads of the uh, hurlers and footballers involved, Dermot O'Sullivan, Stephen McDonnell, Eamon O'Hara. Spoken with the ad agency executives, the director who made it. Um, spoken with the marketing director of CNC at the time who kind of put the deal together alongside Desi Farrell. And um, spoken with Donald O'Neill, of course, who was kind of the the advisor and the commercial director, the first original commercial director of the uh, GPA back at the time. So um, super in-depth piece, about 3,000 words, I think. Um, that'll take you, that'll, that'll put an hour in for you this morning. And um, I, like I thought it was a fascinating slice of life at a very important hinge moment in the relationship that the players have with the GAA. Yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal piece. I mean, like it's uh, one of those that you didn't realise how interested you were in the subject until you start reading it and uh, it's done in oral history format which uh, makes it a, a very easy read as well uh, like I, I love this uh, uh the quote very early on from michael mccardle in the article saying we didn't want another gea player in the farmer's journal with a box of medicine at the end of a hurley uh, and not so veiled dig that that was john fenton right who's uh who, who had the the box of medicine at the end of uh the hurley so and, and not so veiled dig at him. It was, it was all like, of them. Oh, and it wasn't just one, it was all of them. There was like about 15 of them who all made like 300 quid for whatever mastitis cure there was at the time. Liver flute. Uh, liver flute. <laughs> I, uh, I, it must be just, uh, Fenton is obviously the most famous one and it, I think it's also the only one that's available on YouTube. So uh, the rest of them, unfortunately, have got lost in time. But, uh, Joe maybe Cooley wrestling Nordic. a steer. Like he was literally kind of wrestling a cow and jamming the thing into the whatever the injection was, the, the medicine into the car. It's like, look at, look at that strong man on the farm. <laughs> and these guys are like, uh, these guys are walking in water, these fancy dans coming along, walking on, who were they? Uh, Celebrities. Uh, speaking, of, speaking of like a 300 euro, uh, Don O'Neill says in the piece that they approached Lucas Aid for a deal first and they offered them 500 quid. They offered uh, the GPA and GA 500 quid uh, to actually do an ad for Lucas Aids. They were owned by GSK at the time and Desi had worked in the pharmaceutical industry. Jay says, wait until you see how these lads respond with all he said when I told him about the approach. Um, it, like the, It's kind of like illustrates the battle between Lucas Aid and, and Club Energize at this point. And then also there was uh, shots being fired from Fintan Jury as well, which I, I didn't realize that he, he was telling the media that they didn't know what they were doing. And he says, this is Donald again, he says he remembers Desi pacing the office and asking how we're going to respond. Um, but he says that he had been to the Harvard of sports marketing and it was only when I came back home I realised that these people didn't know what they were doing. Uh, like the, It does take a fair degree of security in yourself to actually be this radical with the GEA because this could have been something that people would have turned their noses up at pretty quickly. I don't know if you remember, so they, Mike Frank Russell was in it, so maybe you do. I mean, that, I think you would have been at the peak of your Mike Frank Russell idolatry at that point. Um, afterwards, the players would end up being interviewed post-match when they did well and would start drinking from the, the drink mm. on TV. And there were conniptions being had by the uh, TV company, which it was, oh, maybe, maybe TV3 had games, uh, but did they? I don't think they did. Yeah, so essentially it was, um, it was RTE and uh, they didn't like the notion of like somebody using their 
real estate to be advertising a product like that was, you know, I'm sure there's a guideline somewhere. We need to balance this out. Somebody needs to walk across the screen with the giant LucasAid Sport in case LucasAid might complain to us. Um, and uh, that, that comes up in the piece as well. Kind of this fear that perhaps these GA players might be making some money off the sweat of their brow. Who the hell do they think they are? This is not how we've done things for generations. So, um, yeah, what was my favorite line there? Uh, no, it's misspelling that, hang on. Basically, you want this ad to look more like Nike and less like Liverfluke. Yes, yes, please. Make us look like that. They succeeded in doing that. Like they, they got a director in from abroad to do it, and he didn't know much about GEA. So according to Don O'Neill in the piece, Desi Farrell, this is his first managerial role, actually directing this ad. I just sorry, I'm gonna, hang on, hang on. Sorry, he's from Belfast, Owen. This is the second time this happened on the show. This is not abroad. The Irish Open was in Ireland. It was in Port Rush. Belfast is a part of Ireland. I mean, I, I realize that you're throwing shade at me here as somebody who was born in Belfast abroad. But that's okay. That's okay. I understand. You know, your, your nationalism did I, comes through. Did, in, in... did, did I use the word abroad? Or you did. I apologise for that. I apologise for that. It's, so it's someone who it's someone who admitted he didn't know much about hurling. Were you born in England? Emma reminds me. Yes, but I must. I misspoke. This was not a. This was not a dig at anybody. All I'm saying is that this director didn't know much about hurling. I'm just a bit touchy about it. On that's all. He um, didn't. He didn't. He says he didn't. He said. Uh, the irony of my, my being raised a Protestant in Belfast, I had no preconceptions about the GAA and Gaelic sports weren't really something that I was into. I did know about marketing sport though, and to me this was a no-brainer. We needed to turn these lads into heroes and make them look like legends. And so they did. Yeah, and I think there's, P. I think, yeah, um, Eugene Cloonan, the, the Galway hurler, I think, he does some flick up and Desi's like, yeah, go do that again. So uh, I think Desi was fairly hands-on with the whole thing. Yeah, and so there's actually a copy of the ad embedded in the, um, it, the, the full piece is a minute long and they had different versions of a cut as well. So uh, Muggsy was there and Shefflin was there and a bunch of others too that, um, uh, and the goals kind of rise up and then they run out onto the water and they play on the lake and it looks class. It does look class in fairness and J.O.'s there as well. So when you think back to, um, what year was it? Was it 2000 and, actually it's a question. Uh, whatever year it was, was it uh, 04, 05, around that time? Um, well, you think back to the, the transformative impact it's had. And sorry, the whole part, point about this is that the money that the GPA make from the deal gives the GPA financial security and they are never going away once this ad happens. So that's why it's a hinge point. It's not just that they've found a way to market GEA players that look sexy and isn't liver fluke and is more Nike, but also it feeds the coffers of the GPA to the point that the GA have to take them seriously and that sets them on the path to being the official player's representative body and getting recognition and all that kind of stuff. So um, an interesting sliding doors moment for, uh, for Gaelic Games in Ireland. So that piece by Arthur James O'Dea up on offtheball.com this morning. The Irish Independent this morning leads with a photo of Cahar Healy. A long way for Cahar to hear six weeks after his latest knee surgery. Uh, the London-based Liege veteran prepares to run a marathon while scoring 2,000 points. 1,000 with a slitter. 1,000 with the football, the full story inside the Irish Independent this morning. Meanwhile, we've got a story here that the championship hopes likely to hinge on extensive testing plan for players. So the HSE have announced, obviously, that they hope to roll out a figure somewhere in and around, in and around 100,000 tests per week by the middle of May. Um, an ambitious plan which could see around 2,000 players, managers and backroom staff subject to regular COVID-19 testing is among the options being explored in order to allow GEA and county panels to return to training later this year. And then IRFU set the back Beaumont to stay in lead role despite U-turn speculation. So the IRFU look like they're going to back Bill Beaumont to vote for uh, World Rugby's chief happens today. It's really interesting to me that Bill Beaumont suddenly has become a reform candidate despite the fact that he's been in charge for the last couple of years. I, I love the way you can suddenly all of a sudden change midstream and go, oh, no, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to absolutely radicalise what's coming afterwards. I haven't done it up to this point because, you know, um, I was uh, doing some other stuff. Like, I, I love those elections where it's suddenly like, oh, no, 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 this, the, everything that I've had the opportunity to do that I didn't do, I'm going to do now, seems to be what's going on with uh, the rugby world. Right, the uh, Sports Monday section of the Irish Times uh, interesting story here from Jerry Thornley. Six Nations schedule set for a radical overhaul. 
Um, six station schedule is set for a radical overhaul with organizers considering creating a new window for the women's competition to avoid clashing with the men's, moving it from the traditional February-March slot. There was widespread criticism of the schedule for the tournament this year with a number of the games shoehorned into lunchtime kickoffs, often overlapping each other, and then problems with women's matches being staged on the same day as the men's, meaning fans were unable to attend both. And there was also considerable disbelief at the decision stage, France and England, the title decider on the opening weekend of the 2020 tournament. That match won 19-13, attracted a bumper crowd of 14,000. This year was the second in a row that organisers failed to attract a title sponsor for the Women's Championship. A um, picture of boxing in Nicaragua, which has restarted, is the picture that you can see there with mediocre social distancing from the uh, people in the crowd, but um, sport is back. Uh, Nicaragua has apparently been barely untouched, or barely touched by coronavirus, with the Minister of Health reporting 11 positive cases and three deaths. So, you know, I mean, those stats, they check out. And uh, should size or age dictate in amateur rugby? Just ask Russell Crowe's is Brian O'Connor's column today. Um, players bought into it 100%. McGuinness, Jim McGuinness, talking about the, um, how hard players were pushed in training. And uh, that's obviously an interesting story, given that the toll that it took on many of those players is only beginning to be, to be felt now. Um, Everton appalled after Keane hosts lockdown party. So uh, the covid Hashtag is busy with the Premier League footballers at the moment, and that is your Irish Times this morning. The Irish Examiner this morning leads with a full-page Anthony Daly column, an insider's guide to magic and mayhem of the Sunday game. So uh, Anthony Daly's column focused on uh, his work on the TV show, a photograph there of Jerry Canning from the commentary gantry, and uh, a photograph there as well of uh, Anthony Daly and Don Cusack uh, in studio. You've also got John Caulfield's League of Ireland Dream Team with a difference as well. And uh, that is the Irish Examiner this morning. There's a picture of a uh, big fly on Dalo's head, which I, I missed this. Apparently a giant fly landed on his head at one occasion. And uh, that's what the picture of him and um, Don Logue is there. You can't actually, you, can you see the giant spot on Dalo's head? It looks like uh, he's got a mole, but no, it's not actually a sunspot. It's a, a giant fly that landed in the middle of the broadcast and he had to uh, continue on without it. The, um, sorry, I was supposed to be the Herald, oh, the London Times there, yeah. Football told to come back and lift mood. Government wants sports to return quickly. So Boris is back at work giving the nation a lift, apparently. The uh, BBC politics was the headline yesterday. It's like, all right, uh, Kim Jong-un and, um, and uh, the lads in Moscow wouldn't run a headline like this. But the BBC ran one yesterday about how good it was for the spirits of the UK that Boris Johnson was back working. And maybe it is, maybe that's all it takes for people to be happy while uh, tens of thousands of people are dying around them. The government has urged the Premier League and other sporting com competitions to significantly step up planning for a return to action behind closed doors in the hope of lifting the national mood during the coronavirus crisis. The Times understands that there's been a significant shift by the government in the past few days in favour of restarting sport, with Prime Minister Boris Johnson due to return to work today. After recovering from COVID-19, there is a view that the prospect of live sport returning will create some much needed positivity. Uh, look, maybe there's something in this. It's just that you'd want to make sure that everything is going to be safe when they do it, right? Well, obviously, yeah. I think it'd be pretty, uh, it would be very sensible if there was a, a good chance that things wouldn't be safe. And they were like, yeah, go back to work, go back playing football. And we think that you may or may not be safe or whatever. Like, I think that there has to be a, a huge uh, kind of safety net there that things are going to be fine. Like Arsenal are back in training today, as far as I understand this. It's like a situation where a couple of them will go back in because it's actually better off for them going to the training ground. And a couple of them bringing their own balls or whatever, keeping a distance and not having to run around their local area where they're going to get stopped for selfies. Yeah, so they, uh, the Arsenal players are due to return to their London Colony facility today. The club will only allow five players to use their pitches at any one time. Sessions will last for an hour and players will not do any work as a group. Uh, likewise, I think Brighton are also offering their squad access to training facilities under strict guidelines. Players are expected to self-isolate so self at the first suggestion of any issues as well. So Moisey Keane, um, the party's going to cost them 100 grand. Probably not worth it in the end when you think about it. And Premiership at risk of big fall in TV revenue. So the new, the new um, situation with regards to uh, finances is going to be very interesting to see. This is going to have an impact on salary cap in the NBA. It's probably going to have an impact on salary cap in the NFL as well, where very good players are going to end up on the market available because clubs are uh, unable to... Um, deal with the situation. That's a rugby story, I should uh, specify. It's not uh, Premier League. 
Premiership Rugby is facing a significant drop in the value of its broadcast rights because it failed to agree a deal with either BT Sport or Sky before the coronavirus crisis struck. We we're going to be doing a feature on um, a series of uh, uh, feature length programmes on the future of rugby in the coming days. And um, so I'll do the Herald for you here as well. And the back page of the Herald is just an ad, so I've got to open that up for you. Uh, and uh, they're going through. Uh, some highlights from Dublin sports history. Sure is hard to be humble when you're as good as Ali. This is a uh, 10 greatest Dublin sporting moments. And part one today, number 10. And this is Eamon Carr, Ali and Croker in 1972. There's a great picture of uh, Luke Kelly and Muhammad Ali in... There's loads of great pictures. There's Muhammad Ali and Eddie Kerr. There's Muhammad Ali, Luke Kelly obviously in the ring. And then there's uh, one of Jack Lynch as well. Uh, chatting away to Ali, Ali either very intently listening or bored out of his tree, it's hard to tell which. And uh, Albany Lewis was the, the fight um, that he did there. So, do you want to do the mail next? Uh, I've got the sun here in front of so, me. Gimme five is the headline. FIFA want two more subs to ease strain on stars. Premier League clubs could be allowed to make five substitutions when the season resumes. We've also got Ole Gunnar Solskjaer may flog Pog for buys. He could be forced uh, into a major clear out at Old Trafford to boost his end of season transfer kitty. And John Egan also speaking to the media, eager to get training. He says he hopes to get back training by the middle of next month. Yeah, so that's the, the Irish one there. Um, that's the Irish one for you. That one as well, same thing, give me five. Um, and so we do the mail, do the mail next for you here. That's uh, COVID at Keane hit by 100 grand fine. Um, and GPA refused to comment on failed drug test, uh, which is fairly standard at this stage. The, uh, it's all about Sport Ireland and given whoever it is, the 14 days opportunity to respond. It is a matter for Sport Ireland. So GPA spokesperson Kieran McSweeney, Sport Ireland already in the record to say they don't make any comment on any potential anti-doping process which may or may not be underway. So we're going to have to wait for that player to come out and explain what happened and for uh, details on what the positive test itself was. Um, so I think next for us is going to be the star and the star is the UK star uh, Premier Inn, hotel lockdown plans, get the nod. Top flight football makes return booking. So that's that story that's been rumbling on for ages. Um, that they're going to try and cocoon the players away. It's going to be very difficult for those men in their early 20s who are so rich that they've never had anybody say no to them to be uh, essentially curfewed every day. What was, the, what was the Michael Irving, who was part of the Dallas Cowboys team? You know, the boys will be boys, Jeff Perlman book. He was asked. He was asked about, um, you know, your because that that team famously had a, a house called the White House, where um, it was essentially a brothel, and uh, the um, that team, not Michael Irvin, but that team had that kind of uh, reputation for being bad boys. And uh, he was asked, um, you know, under these circumstances, would you be able to play? And he was like, Oh, look, if we had to play, we'd be able to play. We'd be able to stay in if we had to stay in. But you just wouldn't be able to keep the women out. Was uh, was his take on it? So. Um, uh, the Dallas Cowboys in the 90s believed that they would have been okay with this but what's going to happen with uh, young Premier League footballers who don't seem to be able to exert any self-control um, in 2020 when this comes back that's I think going to be one of the main things that derails Premier League football you know, like unless every single hotel room just has a, a minder sitting outside it uh, the Irish Mirror kind of tells us this morning what might happen party's over for Moyes Keane faces 160k fine for flouting social distancing rules in a shindig for mates. Uh, four stars, hotel is the headline uh, on that story you've already mentioned there. Clubs locked down in own digs for six weeks with away teams taking other half of accommodation for match, then a deep clean. Uh, De Gea hints he'll stay with United forever. Big Jim denies that he pushed any goal players to the brink of burnout. And Pards blast back at Hullet in bonus row. So Alan Pardew has rammed Root Hullet's words back down his throat in the 100k survival bonus row. So um, Hullet has obviously questioned whether Pardew was worthy of bonus payment uh, by default because uh, of uh, Den Haag had avoided relegation. But uh, Alan Pardew was hit back saying, screw you, rude Hullet. Yeah, he's given the money to charity. 
Um, doesn't like to talk about his charity work, obviously. Training may get go ahead. This is Carlo Kane's story in the back of the Irish Daily Star. Returning to inter-county GA training this summer is believed to be under consideration by government officials, so that would be interesting. Not a million miles away from um, what uh, they're planning in England as well. Kerry boss Peter Keane has said you take anything at this stage. Uh, Destea is the headline there. Sorry, Keeper has no plans to leave Old Trafford anytime soon. And Sean Kavanagh, uh, I still have this 10-inch box of tablets that somebody handed me at an international rules training camp. This is him talking about supplements in the GAA, and I guess that's a suggestion that perhaps there's a connection to um, the uh, drug story, that there's been, uh, it's, it's, it's supplements perhaps. Having the drug testers in over the years produced a few moments of laughter and plenty of annoyance is the start of his column there. Um, the first hour I was collected for post-match drug test was the 2003 after the Kerry All-Ireland semi-final. Myself, Kevin Hughes, Seamus Scanlon, and perhaps he thinks it was Dara O'Shea. The elation of winning the game was followed by one of these lads taking you into a dark room at the back of the Hogan. You had to sit there for an hour after the game. I genuinely had seven or eight 500 milliliter bottles of Rockwell water before I could pee. Always on brand. It was Rockwell. It obviously wasn't Club Energize. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Um, yeah, so that, look, that's interesting. I think, uh, again, like we'd love to sit here and speculate about what exactly has happened with that drug test, but it would be uh, irresponsible to do so until we get any of the details. Uh, obviously, we're trying to stack up as much of the details as we possibly can. We'll bring them to you whenever we get them. The back page of The Guardian this morning features a photo of Maradona in 1986. Bernie Rone revisits the infamous quarterfinal and asks the question, were England really robbed by this man in 1986? Moise Keane faces fine from Everton after throwing a party at home is their headline on that. And also the rugby is covered here on the back page of The Guardian. Radical rugby overhaul. Women Six Nations set for separate dates to boost game, which is an interesting idea. The Irish News is next. Got the Irish News for you this morning and uh, we'll stick that up. Now is Madden Tyrone preparing for best case scenario. Red Hands coach hopeful 2020 will see a championship and Tony McEntee picks the best 15 he's played with or managed. That should be a good team. He was on some, he was on some excellent teams. Um, I wouldn't mind pitting some of these uh, best 15s against each other as time goes on. And then finally for now, it's uh, heading over to Spain. Yeah, we've got to ask. Uh, the virus is our priority. Not playing uh, is the headline, which is uh, a fantastic piece of art there. Uh, Nadal, Gasol, uh, a couple of the names mentioned there as uh, Spain looks to get back on its feet. Right, so the um, main stories from that, obviously, um, that we've kind of got into there is that, that, like, look, maybe I was wrong to sound a pessimistic note at the start of the show. Actually, people are, are fairly pessimistic or optimistic that they, uh, they're going to stick the footballers in the hotel. The, um, the government in the UK is definitely pushing for something to return sooner rather than later, and ultimately they're going to get their way because uh, it's in everybody's interest. It's in the players' interests, it's in the Premier League's interests, it's in the broadcasters' interests. And if you have the government weighing in behind it, saying we'll do whatever it takes to get this back to lift the spirits of the nation, um, then we should have Premier League football within the next couple of months. How wise a decision or otherwise that is, I'm not sure, but uh, I guess you would hope that there will be enough research done and uh, enough safeguards put in place to make it safe. And if that happens, then at what point, at what point would it be realistic from an Irish perspective that the testing regime that they were talking about would be to test inter-county footballers on a more regular basis than, um, than everybody else? It would kind of make it mandatory. Yeah, like I, the, I, I wouldn't be pessimistic, certainly, about the prospects of getting Premier League football back and professional sport back. I just like the, the complications are just far wider when it comes to amateur sport, isn't it? Like, it, like we, we've spoken about this before. I think you're of the opinion that if there has to be a, a section of GEA players who can't take to the pitch this summer, then so be it. And for me, those players are frontline workers. Can they just stop their work? to ensure that they can go into some version of quarantine so that they can take to the pitch in a contact sport. Uh, like it's obviously a rhetorical question because no, you can't take frontline workers away from their job at any point for the foreseeable future, it seems. No, absolutely. Like it's, I, I mean, I think we should be having the conversation about whether or not we have some form of games that are played 
at a relatively high level, like if it's a, if it's some kind of bastardized version of a railway cup, like that's better. I'm like worst case scenario is there's absolutely nothing. Best case scenario is that there's some form of intercounty championship behind closed doors, essentially, or with like social distancing in the crowd. Right. That that's the absolute best case scenario you can see in 2020. But everything in between, like old school tournaments, the Oireachtas tournament, like which I don't even really know what the Oireachtas tournament was. Right. It was it an intercounty thing. Do you remember this? They're like in the in the old uh, GA record books where there would have been a list of like so and so won this following number of medals. And you're like, what? What are those tournaments? What language is that? Uh, mm. Like I would I would happily take some 13 aside under 30s bastardized version of uh, a parish like or an amalgamation of counties like a Dublin North, Dublin South, Dublin West like just to get games like that we can sit and watch and go this is the sport that we are all dying to see like I, so best case scenario there is inter-county and it's uh, social distancing and that happens maybe October, November Worst case scenario, there is nothing, like no games. Everything is shut down. The doors continue to be locked, and that's completely the right thing to do from a, a public health perspective. But in between, are we just saying it's either inter county or it's nothing? No, like I, I, I don't think it can be like that. I, I think that there will have to be the exploration of club action as well, and maybe the the, the club action is more doable without. Uh, a, a certain swathe sorry, of people. Sorry, I mean, I, sorry, I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about representative stuff. I, like assuming that uh, whatever happens with the club is is going to happen anyway, because that is the easiest thing to get back up and running. There'll be club training. You would suspect along the lines of what's happening with um, Premier League training at some point, like when because they're, they're already talking about it. There's a bit of what about the testing on that. Like, been, what, 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 do, do we is there going to be an, an enough testing to ensure that all the club players are, are looked after? Well, if there's social distancing, like, and there's no contact for for the first period of time until they decide that actually enough of us now have have had it or don't have it. Like when they're talking about a hundred thousand tests a day uh, or a week, um, that they're that they've been talking about just recently. Like, uh, I, there's there's a lot of things that have to fall in place in terms of how we are actually dealing as a society with this. For example, the government has to be formed and then somebody has to take full responsibility for exactly what the plan is and what our, what our outcomes are going to be. So there's a lot of different bits and pieces that have to fit into place. But if you were a sports organisation, if you were global rugby or uh, Irish rugby or if you were the FAI and you want games to come back, like what are the scenario planning that you're doing? Is there, I guess what I'm talking about with, when it specifically comes to the GAA, what representative level beyond club can we legitimately hope for and what are the scenarios that might happen this year and it's going to have to be like it might have to be something radical as you say because i guess if, if there has to be a large swathe of inter-county players who can't protect with their county it does cheapen the whole idea of an all-ireland championship and it would have an asterisk beside it to say at the very least like we all we all like i think everybody would want to see some sort of action before at the end of the year like the the, the question is just really if you are making some sort of uh, amalgamated version of a championship. If you are mashing counties together or having some sort or some form of a like is is there just actually a shout for ensuring the clubs just actually have the spotlight altogether? And like even those top class players who are available to play, just go and play with their club. And those are the things that are televised. I'm I'm just trying to think what would the public actually care about? Would they care more about watching a Tipperary County hurling game? between two top teams, and I'm talking about the, the, the national viewer here, or would they care more about watching, uh, I don't know, Roscommon and Leitrim taking on uh, a, a Mayo team, for example? I think it might actually be the former, because these are actual fully formed teams that we know a victory or defeat will mean as much to them as it would in any other year. Whereas, like, I think the, the, your idea is radical, and it's like it'd be good to have something. If, that, if that's a solution, then great. But if there's also club action going on, then... I think I'd probably be way more invested in the club action.